But for those of you who are curious, I'm delighted some of you are, uh, I hope, um, let me show you this second approach. Um, it does really work. That's why lots of people teach it. Um, but I'll show you, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll convince you why I'm not so much of a fan, okay? Let's come back to the original question over here. Um, two over x minus three is greater than or equal to one. Now, do you remember when we did the very first example, I highlighted for you that you have to be quite cautious with inequalities. They're not the same as equations. You can do a lot of the same things that you do to inequalities as you do with equations, but you can't do everything, right? Let me give you an example. I'm gonna write this in red because it's wrong, okay? If I took this guy, two on x minus three is greater than or equal to one. It's very, very tempting, especially when you first meet these questions, to say, man, why do I have to fuss around with all of this like tough graphing and complicated asymptotes and stuff like that? I can solve this. I can solve it the same way that I solved this guy over here, right? This was really easy to do. So why can't I do the same thing with the original question? Why can't I just multiply through by x minus three? If you do that, you get uh, two on the left-hand side and then you get x minus three on the right-hand side. And then you look at this and you say, well, um, I'll add three to both sides, I guess. So you get x over here, you get five over here. And you're like, I, I want x on the left-hand side because that's the normal way I would write things. As I'm switching sides, unlike an e equation, um, the inequality has direction, right? So you're like, oh, I'll switch the direction as well. And then I'm done, right? You're like, ah, oh, happy times. I didn't need to go anywhere near a graph. Isn't this a better way to go? Now, you can already see, because we've completed this answer, this is not the way to go. Um, it's part of the answer. Yes, x is less than um, or equal to five. You can see I'm going to the left here. But then it has to stop, right? And this other part of the solution isn't captured at all by this method. Now, that then leads to the question, but, well, but why? why? Why does this break down? Like, why doesn't it work? It works with equations. Why doesn't it work with inequalities? And the answer is because, let me find another little spot to write on over here. Sorry, this is being a little bit messy. The answer is because there are some things that you can't do with inequalities. For example, if I said to you, one is less than two, um, none of you would bat an eyelid. You'd be like, why are you wasting our time showing us something simple, Mr. Wu? But watch me do something to this inequality that you can do with an equation, but you absolutely cannot do with an inequality. I'm gonna mu multiply both sides of this inequality by a number. It's gonna be the same number. Multiply the left by something, multiply the right by something. We do that on equations all the time. But if the number I choose is something like say, oh, I don't know, negative one, if I multiply both sides of the equation by negative one, or indeed by any other negative number, you can't write the same inequality down below because negative one is not less than negative two. Negative one is actually greater than negative two, so this inequality is no longer valid. Now, what we're trying to say is, there's actually a different rule for dealing with uh, negative numbers on inequalities. You can do them. You just actually have to switch around the inequality. That's how we handle these things. You can multiply by a negative number so long as you remember the right thing to do with the direction of the inequality. Now the problem with doing it over here is because I'm not multiplying both sides by just the number, like negative one or negative five. What am I multiplying both sides by? Look carefully. The answer is I'm multiplying both sides by this, x minus three. x minus three is not a number. It's a variable. Like if x changes value, x minus three could be positive, that, that's why this thing you got at the end actually is partly right. But x minus three can be negative as well. And if it's negative, that means you gotta switch the inequalities around and you get a whole different question, which you have to combine with this. And it's confusing, it's a bit of a mess. It's why we say, don't do it like that. This is a bad way to go, okay? Now there's a way to overcome this. And this is what the heart of the second technique is, right? This, the, uh, the way to overcome this problem of um, multiplying by negatives is to not multiply by negatives. Instead of multiplying by x minus three, the suggestion is, and many of you will be uh, exposed to this technique, is multiply instead by x minus three all squared. How does this work? Why is this better? Well, when you multiply by x minus three, remember x minus three could be, could be positive, but it could be negative, right? And so it, it leads to this problem. But x minus three all squared, this is what's ingenious about it, no matter what value you put into x, right? This thing cannot be negative. X minus three all squared cannot possibly be negative. It could be zero, um, but it can't be negative because you know if I put in say one, one take away three sure enough is negative, it's negative two. But then you square it, you get four and everything is fine, okay? So that's where this technique comes from. In some ways that is very clever. 
Um, but let me show you where it leads, okay? This is what you get. When you take the original question, you multiply both sides by x minus three all squared, right? It has to be squared. Uh, and then what happens? Well, let's, let's start to solve this thing, right? On the right-hand side, sorry, on the left-hand side, I should say, um, there's some stuff that's gonna cancel, right? So this factor of x minus three on the top cancels with this factor of x minus three on the bottom. Um, the strength of this technique is, great, I no longer have uh, fractions to deal with. So I'm like, this is immediately something that I uh, feel more comfortable dealing with, okay? Now at this point over here, you've got a couple of choices. Um, one thing that is very tempting is you just expand everything, then you'll have a bunch of like terms and you just collect them. And that's, that's fine, I wanna say that's okay. Um, but I, I like to avoid that if I possibly can. Like expanding is a very, it's a blunt instrument, right? If I can do this in a more clever way, I'd prefer to. And I notice that on the left and the right hand sides, um, I have common factors, right? You see x minus three is a common factor. So what I'm gonna do is, let me move this over a little bit so I have a bit more space on the right hand side to do my working. Uh, I am going to subtract uh, this term over here. I'm gonna subtract it from both sides. Okay, so I'm gonna go minus two x minus three. Okay, so I've subtracted it from that side. Um, this inequality stays the same and I get left with a zero over there on the left hand side since I subtracted that, okay? Now, again, a lot of you are like, just expand, just expand. But I, I really don't want to, because look, I can actually do this in a much simpler way if I recognize, whoopsie daisy, if I recognize that that common factor can be factorized out, right? I've got an x minus three out the front. Uh, I'm gonna write it in long form, just so you see it really, really obviously, right? And x minus three times x minus three out the front, there's still a zero over there, nothing's happened to it. And then I have a look and I say, well, when I take out this factor, of x minus three from both of them, right? Uh, what do you get? Well, x minus three comes out the front. And then how many x minus threes do you have uh, over here in this first term? We have this many of them, x minus three of them. Then when you have a look on the right hand side, you've got a few more x minus threes. You've got minus two of them, right? So therefore, I'm gonna get x minus three minus two lots of x minus three. Can you see how I've factorized that? Um, a lot of you are kind of like, what? that looked weird, that was confusing. If that is the case, number one, I'm gonna suggest look at it a bit longer, um, or number two, go ahead and expand if this is really breaking your brain. Um, but I prefer it because expanding is a, a process where errors cro uh, creep in, so I'm trying to avoid it as much as I can. So therefore, um, x minus three, x minus five, this is my factorization, okay? Now, have a look at this guy, right? This guy here on the right hand side, um, maybe I will put on the left hand side actually, I'll put x minus three, x minus five on the left hand side. Since I'm reversing this thing, I'm gonna reverse the direction of the inequality, less than or equal to zero. That thing on the left hand side, it's not a messy hyperbola anymore, is it? It's actually a nice, comfortable parabola. You can draw this, you could draw it in your sleep, right? It's gonna have two intercepts. One of them's gonna be at three. That scale's terrible, sorry, let's fix that. Uh, that's better. Uh, one of your intercepts is going to be at three. The other intercept is gonna be at five. You've got a parabola that goes through it. And then you say, when's this parabola uh, less than zero? When is it beneath the axis? And the answer is, there it is. So you say, aha, three is less than x, it's less than five, and I've included my boundaries, okay? Now, at this point, I hope because we highlighted it before, you're realizing there's a problem with my solution, right? This is not the solution. Um, there's an issue with this uh, inequality that I've stated over here. I've included the boundary, but I wasn't supposed to. Now, in the original way that we did this question, the hyperbola's graph kind of told you why you weren't supposed to include that, right? Because you're like, you can't, you can't get there. You can get close to x equals three, but you can never reach it because there's an asymptote, right? The reason why, the Achilles heel of this technique, is that when you do this, you get rid of the asymptote. You get rid of that discontinuity that the original question had. As soon as you get to this line, this line one right here, right? See how there's no more fractions anymore? And we were like, yay, no fractions, it's easy to deal with. Well, the problem with having no fractions is that the original question had fractions. So it has discontinuities that my new question doesn't. So the way to overcome this, for those of you who, some people love this method, this is like, ah, oh, I'm at home, I feel very comfortable with this. The way to overcome that sort of shortcoming is, you look at the original question, right there, and you say immediately, hey, wait a second, x can't equal three. 
like just look at it, right? As soon as you put in x equals three, the whole thing explodes. So you make a note of this uh, discontinuity right at the outset. And once you arrive at your final solution, which is down here in the bottom, once you arrive at there, you check it against any discontinuities that you have determined from earlier. And you say, wait, hold on a second, x can't equal three, uh, even though I've said that it can equal three. So therefore, I have to defer to this discontinuity and I have to get rid of that boundary like so. And now we have the same answer that we arrived at before. So like I said, um, this is a very common method. Uh, in fact, some textbooks even just go out there and say, this is uh, my prescribed technique for doing it. Um, the reason why is because there are, some, there are some nice things about it. Like I like getting rid of fractions as much as the next person, but you have to be cautious. You have to see that with this question, actually the fraction part of it is essential. It changes your answer entirely. And so that's why my preference is actually, you know what? You've got to get good at graphing anyway. So you might as well invest in it now and use that graph and use that technique to be able to arrive at the right solution straight away with no like, oh, my answer is right, but part of it's wrong and I need to fix it up. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, um, let me know, but there's both of them there for you um, so that you can choose from.